And then we come into verse 25 and it says, But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not forget a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Well, it's talking about male and female, which is terminology is here. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty. Well, this is not the liberty movement. This is not the liberal movement. This is not talking about it's okay to be in the liberal movement. You know, some people have taken this the wrong way, I believe, and their idea of liberal goes way and beyond what the Apostle Paul is talking about here. This is a liberty that comes out of the perfect law. What is the perfect law? What is the perfect law? We had the law, which the Jewish people would have considered to be perfect. Right? The law was on the Ten Commandments that came down with Moses, and his face shone, so much so that he had to wear a veil because he frightened them to death. And he had the Ten Commandments, and they were put into the Ark of the Covenant eventually, and that's where they, that was the law of God, the basic law the Ten Commandments. So that law never went. That law stands forever. That is the perfect law. But it was interpreted all wrong. They became rules conscious and regulations conscious instead of realising that law came through love. That law came because God chose the Jewish people for his own. They became the children of God. And so when Christ came, he summed up the law for us in two, which we speak of every week in the liturgy. It's still the perfect law. It hasn't changed the law. He didn't come and change it. He just re-emphasized the whole point of it was to love God, which is the first four, and to love our neighbor as ourselves, which is the second six. That's it. He didn't change it. He didn't abolish the law. He just said, hey, folks, you got it wrong. <laughs> you know, you know, you interpret the law this way. Well, that's not the way you do it. You know, you look through the eyes of love when you interpret the law. Otherwise, you interpret it wrongly. If you look at it, mm, what does it say? Mm, what does it say in verse 19 and 20? It says, so then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. So listen to what I'm saying. Swift to hear, slow to speak. Don't be gabbling on, you know. And slow to wrath, slow to anger. Why? Because if you don't wait and listen properly, then you will start gabbling on and running off at the mouth and you'll be saying things you don't really know what you're talking about and haven't really thought through and then sometimes you'll get angry and that will not be good because you haven't really heard in the first place and and that's really what happens here for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God so we need to listen to what Jesus said when Jesus summed up the commandments in two, he didn't do it for fun. He didn't do it just because it was something to do that day. You know, he didn't have much to do, so he thought, oh, I'll, just, I'll just mess around with the commandments today. No, he didn't do that, did he? He, he was very serious in, in teaching us that we'd got all these hundreds of laws built around the Ten Commandments. And it's true. Each one of those commandments, for example, murder, it doesn't just cover the act of murdering someone physically. It covers many things in murder. Slander, assassinating someone, speaking evil about someone. These, you're murdering them in your mind and you might just as well have effectively have gone and done it with a knife, you know. So making lots of laws was their way of trying to work that out. And it became a very, oh, it's a heavy yoke, you know. I, I can't turn without, I've broken a law here, you know. I can't live that kind of 
totally contained life. It doesn't work for me. So anyway, let's move on. It talks about the perfect law of liberty and continues in it. And is not forget a forgetful here, but does, but is a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. If we're interpreting the law in that liberty that Christ brought us through interpreting them by love, then we will be able to do it and we will be blessed. If we try to do it under the old system of the law, under the Mosaic law, and the way they exaggerated that laws in so many ways, we will not be blessed. Our lives will be a misery. And we will become very critical and very, very judgmental. Because that's what it that's what it begets. So if anyone among you thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart. This one's religion is useless. So running off at the mouth is not the way to go, folks. That's what he's saying here. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. So spouting that you're a Christian and spouting that you're doing all these wonderful things for God and that you are a wonderful person or you're indignant, judgmental and critical because you are a law keeper does not make you attractive as far as God's concerned, let alone people. Okay? Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. Listen. Here's your faith being expressed. You're justified through the faith of trusting in Christ, but here's how it comes out. Pure and undefiled religion. God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So, arise, bride, is what we're hearing again. Arise and come away. Don't be stained by the world. Come out. You are in the world. You're not of the world. Come out. Come out. Get real. What is your Christianity doing for you and for others? Is it... Have you got a sense of purpose? Have you got a sense of direction? You know, if you just keep plugging on with this... I'm justified by faith. I'm a Christian. I've got it in my head. I'm justified by faith. And you're not doing anything with it. Then it's not real. It's not working. You're not exercising your faith. You know, when you come up to a problem or a trial and you fall apart and you go back to the world's ideas of working things out and doing things, that's not faith. That's foolishness or presumption. Faith is when you really exercise faith and you trust in the rock that you're standing on. Christ and you are not in the world you have arisen you have gone to the bridegroom you the bride has come out and prepared yourself and set yourself apart and become submissive to God and obedient to him and loyal he has become your lover and your partner and your your all in all and your life changes and it, it isn't a chore to change your life when that's happened. When you have been called through love and understand the love of God and felt the love of God and want to be the bride of Christ, it's not a chore to change. When we talk about people, when they come to God, they change. Sometimes they don't hang around with the same friends. Sometimes they get a new life. Sometimes they have to give up their old life and they go, oh, I don't know if I can do that. What are you getting in return? Why would you not want what God is offering you? If he knows everything about you, he knows even the number of hairs on your head. If he knows everything and has all resources at his disposal, which the world does not have, even though it's going into economic decline, we are Christians, we are God's people who owns the whole lot. And he can change things and transfer the wealth and do all manner of things he needs to do. We don't have to ask him why. When he fed the Israelites in the desert for 40 years and... Manna came from heaven for 40 years and water in the desert and truckloads and truckloads and trainloads of, of quail came down for 40 years and their shoes didn't wear out. We worry about whether we're going to get five pound up the road or not. It, you know, let's get real. If we really believe in those miracles, if we really believe that that happened, 
which the scripture talks of, if we can trust God for, for minor things, we ought to be able to trust God for the major things. If we understand the miracles that have happened, why don't we understand the miracle of the Eucharist? Why can't we trust God with our finances? Why can't we trust God with everything and give him our lives and submit ourselves and be the bride that he wants for the bridegroom? Why can't we do that? Because we haven't been changed on the inside. We haven't responded to the call. We need to have a purpose in life that follows God. Amen? Amen. Praise God.